Good morning, church, and greetings to you in Jesus' name. Today, we will continue with part two of our membership series. It's going to be about the local church. Uh, last time, we spoke about the universal church, and today we will look at uh, what is it? What is the local church? Uh, should we be part of one? Uh, we will look at that today. Should we take a moment to pray? Father God, we love you and adore you. We bow down before you and we declare that you are our God and we are your people. Previously, we couldn't have come and called you our Heavenly Father, but you made that possible by sending your only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who died for our sins and was buried and raised the third day, all in accordance with Scripture. You were seen by many witnesses, you instructed your disciples, you ascended into heaven, you poured out the Holy Spirit upon us, and today you intercede for your church, you are preparing a place for your church, you're coming back for the church and to judge the world. We ask, Holy Spirit, that you will open the eyes of our understanding as we engage with Scripture, that we may become more like Christ, we might grow in righteousness that we might uh, bring glory to God in the way we go about uh, doing life. And we ask that we will know you more and uh, we will love you deeper and serve you faithfully even to the very end. We ask all this for your glory, uh, uh, for your name's sake and uh, for our benefit. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Like mentioned, uh, we'll be looking at what is a local church. Firstly, I hope to trace the thread of God wanting a family right from the beginning uh, to the New Testament. And uh, then we will look at one particular passage where Jesus speaks about uh, the local church. That will be from Matthew 18. Uh, that will be, uh, we'll look at in a little bit of detail. So shall we jump straight in? So in terms of the uh, local church, you've, that word for the church in Greek is ekklesia, which means uh, called out. Called out of the world unto himself. Called from death to life. Called from darkness to light. Uh, so it's, it, in the essence of it, it's a called out group of people, a congregation of people. Uh, that's where we get the word uh, church, a gathering of God's people. So you keep that in mind. I want to just take you right back to uh, Genesis. You've got instances where um, Noah uh, was called out of the world. And you've got instances where Abraham was called out of his family. And as Abraham journeys uh, with God, uh, each time in his life, you'll find that he pitches his tent, he builds an altar. He pitches his tent and builds an altar. We see that when God appeared to him, he does that. He does that near Bethel and I, and then he comes and revisits that again. See, the idea is, there is the home and there's the place of worship. So both of them are, are meant to be part of God's family, your home and the, the place of worship. So that was how it was. His uh, sons and grandson uh, also uh, did similar. Uh, they, they pitched their tent and they built an altar uh, to worship. As we move from there to the story of Exodus, when the children of Israel, again, they are called out of Egypt, out of slavery, uh, to freedom, uh, out of oppression, to uh, liberty. And uh, again, they're called out. And they move uh, from Egypt under the leadership of Moses, who is the mediator of that covenant between God and his people. Uh, again, what happens is uh, God gives a very... Uh, descriptive, uh, elaborate uh, pattern of God's tent uh, and people's tents. So in the, in the patriarchs, you have their home 
and they had a place of worship. They had their home, they had their place of worship. They had their home and the place of Jacob, uh, worship. For this is for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Now you have got the uh, lots of tents and God's tent in the middle. You can see that the idea is that God wants uh, his tent uh, right in the midst of his people. So uh, their lives revolved around God. So they had their own homes where they lived as God's people. They also congregated around the tabernacle in order to worship God. Now let's move from there to uh, King David. King David uh, was living now uh, in more permanent dwelling, but God's house was in a temporary dwelling, the tabernacle of David. Okay, so again, uh, you had people's homes and uh, God's house, and people lived and congregated there to worship God. It was a visual reminder that they were God's people and he was their God. Then it was a son who built a more permanent structure of building a temple. So uh, they had moved from God's tent and their tent to their house and God's house. Okay, So this was the system. But after a period of time, when the children of Israel were carried away in captive, the temple was obviously miles away from where they were captives in Assyria initially and Babylon later, uh, you'd find they were far, far away. The temple was also uh, destroyed. And uh, during that particular period of the exile, they were living in a foreign country and uh, they kept their faith alive by gathering together around the instruction of God or the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, they gathered around it. So, and this gathering together, uh, the Greek word is uh, synagoge, that means come together. And you have got, you needed at least a minimum of 10 men who wanted to study the, uh, the Torah uh, to have a synagogue. So they gathered together and then their families gathered together, their uh, children gathered together, and uh, thus started uh, they had their home and they had the synagogue, which was their place of worship where they gathered. And uh, what did they do in the synagogue? Uh, they, uh, they, did their, they prayed, uh, they praised God, and they did their preaching. And they did that shared life of knowing, uh, doing community together, doing uh, a, a, a God family together. Okay? And they looked out for each other. Uh, they had uh, synagogue leaders later, you had uh, teaching rabbis later, you had elders and you had deacons, uh, they, they had uh, offerings and they helped people who were poor, uh, they also helped uh, other, uh, other synagogues if they had difficulty. Much later, buildings also came. So it was uh, in that sort of a hostile setting. Uh, that uh, the synagogue came. The church today is, uh, or the church that uh, we, the Christian church, was is not modeled around the temple, but around uh, the synagogue. You'd find during Jesus' time in uh, small uh, villages, there was one uh, synagogue. If it is a big town, you could have three or four. If it is a city, you could have multiple, uh, 10 plus uh, synagogues around. So um, after the exile, the temple was rebuilt. So now you have the house, you have got uh, the synagogue, and you got the uh, temple. So uh, the temple, they came, they had priests, and uh, they had sacrifices. They had uh, three annual festivals they all congregated to the temple for, and that was going on. And the synagogue, they met once a week to, uh, to pray, uh, to praise, and to proclaim God's word, uh, and to uh, worship on a regular basis as a community. And of course, in their homes, they practice uh, prayer again, uh, and praise God together, and they learn together in their homes. So that was happening. Then, uh, moving on from there, when Christ came, uh, and uh, Christ 
uh, offered himself as a uh, sacrifice uh, for our sins so that we can be reconciled with God. So when that transformation happened and he was buried and raised on the third day and um, uh, he asked them to wait in Jerusalem till they are endured with power from on high. So that's what exactly they did. And about 10 days after his ascension, the Holy Spirit was poured out on the church and the apostles explained what was going on. And then what happened? They, they uh, gathered together in the temple uh, and they gathered together in their homes as well. So uh, both were existing. And gradually uh, the, this transition happened from moving away from the model of the temple uh, to homes. And obviously homes were small, but uh, as they had, uh, as Christianity spread, they met a number of homes. And these uh, home communities or home churches were modeled around the synagogue where people gathered together to praise, uh, to pray and to proclaim God's word or sit under his instruction. They also did two other things that uh, Christ had ordained. One is they, they, they baptized people uh, who, were, who were coming to faith uh, as a sign of their, uh, their inward transformation that's happened, that experience of being born anew or born from above happened. So they were baptized into Christ, they were baptized, they were welcomed into the community or the family. And the next thing is they had an ongoing ceremony, which was also one of the ordinances of Christ, which was breaking of bread, which they did quite uh, frequently, as much as uh, once a week. Okay, so this is the model of the church. And this continues, uh, each church was a local church and each church had, uh, they uh, decided uh, for themselves uh, about the practicalities, how they handle their money, etc. Initially, the elders appointed uh, sorry, the apostles appointed the elders and uh, deacons were appointed locally by the church themselves. And latterly, from within the congregation, uh, elders rose up. From within the congregation, uh, deacons rose up. So uh, keep that in mind. So uh, that was the picture. But as time progressed, you know, we didn't have large church buildings probably until 300 years uh, uh, after uh, Christ. And uh, that began to happen. And gradually, somehow, there was a shift uh, from the synagogue model to back to the temple model, where the, uh, the clergy or the, uh, the priests returned, uh, almost a sacrifice returned in some of the churches. You have got that the, the, the uh, Holy Communion is enacted in a way as though Christ is crucified afresh. But that that all was shifting back to the uh, the temple pattern, but actually uh, it was meant to be uh, the the synagogue pattern. So you get the picture. So in which people became spectators and the clergy became the actors and they were observers rather than participants. So uh, the main thing that happened after Christ is important for us to remember: the the temple was made redundant because uh, all of us, uh, the, the church, is considered to be the temple of the Holy Spirit. The priesthood was made redundant in that, uh, that this priesthood of all believers. And the sacrifice was made redundant because we have got one sacrifice uh, permanently for all our sins. And he is our high priest. Jesus is our high priest. So do we have leaders in a local church? Of course you do. You've got uh, people who do the administrative leadership. You've got the teaching role. You've got deacons who looked after the fabric of the building, the money of the building, the well-being and the welfare of the congregation. Uh, that pastoral care was provided by deacons. Um, where are we now? We are in a place where uh, that we need to uh, regain or clarify uh, what is our model? I think our model should be one uh, where it's a local church in which you have uh, elders and you have got deacons and uh, we collectively as a congregation have a responsibility with the leadership uh, uh, to be uh, guardians of the gospel, to raise disciples, 
uh, and to look after the well-being of the church and also to welcome new people uh, into God's family as they respond to the good news of God, uh, that how God is reconciling people through Jesus Christ. So keep that picture in mind. Okay, so that's the picture we need to have. Um, today we live in an age where many Christians are lone rangers. They feel like they don't need the church or they say that uh, there's no church that's perfect. Actually, what is the church here for? Church is God's family. It's, you know, while we aim to uh, becoming like Christ, you know, on this side of the world, you're not going to get the perfect thing. It is more, I often say, church is like a workshop uh, rather than a showroom and uh, in which uh, God is working on each of us and the Holy Spirit is uh, working on each of us and as we yield and submit to God's will and submit to God's plan and uh, even in this uh, thing of being committed to God and being committed to one another, submitting to the elders and the elders diligently serving uh, uh, the church. So that's a beautiful model where uh, there is frustration but there is forgiveness. Uh, and uh, there's, a, there's a learning, patiently learning to bear with one another. This is not an excuse for all of any of us to behave badly or to be inconsiderate to each other. This is not that sort of thing, but actually we are meant to uh, grow together as a family. So I, I do believe that a, a local church should not be so big that you can't connect. Of course, we have got home groups uh, so that even if it is big, uh, we can uh, have a level of intimacy, accountability, and growth. This brings me to uh, the, the scripture which I was going to read from Matthew chapter 18. So you can, uh, uh, if you have your Bibles, you can turn with me to Matthew chapter 18. I'm going to look at five verses now. Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 to 20. Um, it's a, it begins like, if your brother uh, sins against you. Note, this is a fellow believer uh, is sinning against you, not against the whole world, but against you. Then what's your responsibility is you go and tell him his fault between you and him alone. So assume if, uh, some, if somebody had sinned against me, it is my responsibility to take the initiative to go to that particular person and not to anybody else, not to broadcast it, but to that particular person. And if he listens to you, you have gained your brother. If he does not listen to you, then take two, uh, uh, one or two other people along with you that every charge may be established by the evidence of two or three witnesses. This is a new principle from the book of Deuteronomy. But make sure you have ascertained the facts right. Very often, offense is not given, but offense is taken. So uh, we need to be careful that we uh, find out all the facts. And uh, when you ask someone else to go with you, then make sure uh, they too are uh, know the full picture and uh, don't just uh, jump in uh, like uh, headless chickens or like a bull in a china shop, okay? So if he refuses to listen to them, then go and tell the church. That is the verse I want to home in on. When Jesus go and tell the church, Jesus only mentions church twice. One is the universal church, which we looked at Matthew 16, where he said, I will build my church, and then this is the local church. He's saying, go and tell the local church. Otherwise, what happens if, imagine, if somebody sinned against me, uh, a brother sinned against me, uh, and uh, I went and spoke to him, and he's not listening, and then I took one or two uh, people with me and spoke to him, and he's still not listening. Then what he's saying, hey guys, uh, just bear with me. I'm going to jet set. I'm going to go around all the world and tell this particular thing this brother has done to me. That's not what's implied. In other words, the local family needs to sort out things uh, locally. And uh, uh, Jesus is here talking about the local church. This is not possible if you're not part of a local family. There are many Christians who want to be lone rangers. They don't want to commit themselves. They think 
uh, I can manage my life affairs without the church, etc. No, you're born uh, of God and you're born into his family. You have no choice if you're a true Christian. You have to submit to a local body. You will never find a perfect body. I'm just going to ask you a question. Uh, how many of you, we did a series on Corinthians, didn't we? How many of you would like to join the Corinthian church with its schism? People are getting drunk, uh, people are being selfish, people are uh, uh, tolerating sin, and uh, people are very bad in the way they exhibit their spiritual gifts, and there's uh, uh, false teachers, and there's so much strife, misunderstanding about the doctrine of uh, death and resurrection. All these things are going on there. Would you like to join that church? But yet in those days, in one city, there was only one church. In large cities, there were lots of smaller churches. You can find in Romans chapter 16, for example, the church that met at the house of so-and-so uh, is mentioned. So you, you, you get a picture. So, uh, in, so this cannot be practiced unless the church is uh, uh, small enough uh, to hold people accountable and to to the main idea is not to beat the person up or any of this it's it's what you want to reconcile with your brother it says you have if the person you've gained a brother you get that picture that's beautiful isn't it and it says if they did not then treat him like a tax collector uh, or a gentile let's go back to the synagogue briefly uh, it, when a jewish person uh, collaborated uh, and uh, with the romans during that time and became a tax collector, he was shunned by the church because they felt that this guy has entered into a partnership or a deal uh, with people who are outside of the family of God. So they treated him as thing. That is why Zacchaeus was not part of the crowd. Uh, Matthew, the tax collector, he left everything and followed Jesus. You get the picture. So uh, the other one is Gentiles were not allowed to join God's family unless they uh, uh, converted from uh, converted to Judaism uh, through uh, ritual cleansing and proclamation and offering a sacrifice. So similarly, uh, to be part of a local church is not the it, the local church is not the building. The church meets in the building. This is a church building. In other words, the church meets the building. The church together owns the building, if you know what I mean. Uh, you got to keep that in mind. So to become part of a local church, you need to be part of the family of God. You need to have acknowledged that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus is my Christ. Jesus is my Savior. And you're turning from sin and putting your trust in him to save you from uh, save you from the wrath to come and all unrighteousness and you're acknowledging him as your high priest you're confessing your sins daily you're confessing his lordship daily submitting to his authority and live and walking in his footsteps loving god with all your heart loving your neighbor like you love yourself and loving each other in the family so the world might know that we are his disciples so you get the picture Okay, so let's hold on to that. And then let's go a little bit further. And he says, uh, treat them like a tax collector. And then he goes on to say, if you bind something uh, on earth, it shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you lose on earth, it shall be loosed in heaven. The idea he's saying is what you decide. If you decide that brother is not willing to reconcile, and if you decide to keep him out of fellowship, then uh, uh, it will be heaven will honor that particular thing. If you decide to forgive that brother and include him, then uh, heaven will honor that. And then he goes on to say, if any two of you agree on earth about anything they ask, it will be done for them. Saying, God is saying, I will honor uh, what you guys agree upon. Uh, and uh, then he, uh, so the, God is saying, I will validate uh, these things. And in this context of this correction, he says, where two or three are gathered in my name, I am among them. So in other words, God is there when they're dealing with these issues. God does not depart when there's problem in the church. We might jump ship, but hey, don't jump ship. If there's issues in the church, let us work together. Let us work together for the reconciliation uh, of between brothers and sisters. And let's not, uh, let's make it a principle that we're going to love God with all our hearts, with all our soul, with all our might, and love our neighbor like we love ourselves. 
and let's love one another uh, genuinely in a in a way that uh, how Christ loved his church and he gave himself for her to that way let us learn uh, to love and may uh, I hope that this has helped you to see uh, the pattern of the journey of how the local church came to be and uh, today you're part of this local church and uh, I and uh, if you're not yet become a member of this local church why not come and meet me or meet the eldership and just come and say hey I want to be a member what does it entail to be a member uh, we'll be you know, probably in the next series we'll say how do you join a local church so till then I would want you to mull over these things and thank God that you're part, uh, you're reconciled with him and you're born of God and you're born of a family. If you have not yet done that, uh, come and meet me and I'd love to lead you further uh, in that journey. Uh, shall we pray? Father God, we love you uh, so much. Uh, thank you, Lord, that uh, you, we are born and you, we are born again. Uh, we are born of you. We are born from above. We have experienced that regeneration. And uh, today we stand uh, as your children. And you did not leave us uh, uh, in isolation, but we were born into your family. Uh, we thank you for your local family, your local church here at Cornerstone. We pray for any who is not yet, uh, who's born in you, but not part of a, a, a local family yet. I ask that you will speak to them, that they will commit themselves, they will submit to a local family and uh, uh, take responsibility uh, to be family. Uh, Lord, we pray. We pray for others who who might be uh, they have not yet uh, even come to join your family, uh, but that today they've heard the gospel. I ask, Lord, uh, that uh, you will bring about that new birth in their lives. Uh, and we ask for us uh, patience and love uh, and uh, to display uh, gentleness and respect as we help them in their journey. Uh, thank you, Lord. We thank you for your local church. Lord, I ask that you will build your church. You will look after your local church as well. And uh, that we might shine for you. And we will live uh, for you. And we ask all this for your namesake and for the benefit of uh, 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 people around us and for each other. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Uh, God bless you and have a wonderful week. Next time we meet, we'll see how can we join a local church.